nothing worth more that could ever come close. No thing can come You're our living home. Your presence, Lord. Tasted and seen of the sweetest of loves, where my heart becomes free and my shame is undone. Your presence, Lord. Holy Spirit, you are To be overcome by your presence, Lord. Your presence, Lord. There's nothing worth more that could ever come close. No thing can compare, you're our living home, your presence, Lord. I've tasted and seen of the sweetest of loves, where my heart becomes free. And my shame is undone Your presence, Lord Holy Spirit, you are welcome here Come flood this place and fill the atmosphere your glory, God, is what our hearts long for, to be overcome by your presence, Lord, your presence, Lord. Are you ready to sing with me? Let's sing. Let us become more aware of your presence let us experience the glory of your goodness let us become more aware of your presence let us experience the glory of your goodness let us become more aware of your experience the glory of your goodness. Let us become more aware of your presence. Let us experience the glory of your goodness. Holy Spirit, you are Flood this place and fill the atmosphere. Your glory, God, is what our hearts long for to be overcome by your presence, Lord. Our worship is a spiritual exercise, and we needed that little boost this morning, so thank you to Ron DeBodowitz, Freeman's own Ron DeBodowitz, affectionately known around here as Rhoda. <laughs> <laughs> so 
It's always a treat to have uh, Rhonda with us, and thank you for opening our hearts to worship today and preparing our hearts for worship today. God is good. And all the time. Amen. Let's stand as we join together in our call to worship. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Again, today we come together to worship the God of creation, of salvation, of time and eternity, the God of all peoples, of all nations, of all conditions, of all people everywhere. Praise the Lord. All that is within me, praise God's holy name. Praise the Lord and remember all his kindnesses in forgiving our sins, in curing our diseases, in saving us from destruction, in surrounding us with love. The Lord is full of mercy and compassion. The Lord is slow to anger and willing to give us gifts of love. Praise the Lord. All that is within me, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord indeed. Let's turn our attention to our worship screen as we sing Joyful, Joyful, We Adore Thee. song to open our worship with, uh, worth it with today. Let's uh, bow and seek the Lord's grace together. Let's pray. Our Father, I pray that this morning we would enter into the time of worship with a desire to draw near to you. Lord, we get so wrapped up in our own lives and our own concerns about the things that we are going through and things that are going on in this world that we find ourselves losing heart. Help us to Turn our eyes to you this morning, acknowledging your power and your greatness. It is in you that we trust. So we come to worship you today, and we ask that you would fill our hearts and our minds with joy, the joy that's offered to us through the gift of salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. May we truly rejoice in your grace today, and may the Holy Spirit empower our worship and make it a sacrifice of praise. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning and God bless you for joining us through our television ministry today. Let's take a second and welcome each other. So when I started singing here, 
lots and lots and lots of years ago, what I was told was, you know, get up there and introduce yourself and tell everybody what you do and give a little bio. And I just feel like y'all know me and um, <laughs> I'm famous apparently. And so I'm gonna skip all that and go right to the meaning of this song to me. Um, so Need You Now came into my life when one of my friends was going through a divorce. And it hit me pretty hard because the divorce came pretty unexpectedly. Just all of a sudden it was like, no, I'm not going to do this anymore. Um, and so I wondered what on earth they were going through in their minds. How many times have we called out to God, just, just take this. Just help me keep breathing. Um, because I can't imagine, um, and in our own lives, cancer, loss of a parent, loss of a child, just all of the things. How many times do we cry out, just take this, just help me to breathe? And that's what this song means to me. story to tell and everybody's got a wound to be healed I want to believe there's beauty here cause oh I get so tired of holding on I can't let go
Once again, Rhonda Bodowitz, thank you for sharing that beautiful song. And it's interesting that, uh, you know, the Christian music world, um, a lot of, there's been a lot of criticism about different songs. You know, they call them the 7-Eleven songs, where you got seven words, you sing them 11 times, something like that. But then you have these other songs that really kind of speak to where you might be. And I think that's, that's one of those songs. And I think a lot of, a lot of people in uh, church today and those tuning in uh, could listen to those lyrics and understand exactly uh, that kind of prayer that's being offered through that song. So thank you for sharing that with us today. At this time, I would like to uh, just uh, throw it out there. Are there any announcements that we need to be made aware of today? Of course, as a celebration of our new members today, we are going to be having a brunch uh, just after church. And uh, if we can't have a potluck, the, the, the second best thing is a brunch. So we're having a, br uh, a brunch to recognize those members and to have a time of fellowship today. So please stick around after church. Uh, there will not be uh, Sunday school because we want to have time to, to welcome new members and to fellowship with them. Um, but Lily is uh, asking that after the kids have something to eat, that if they could come upstairs and they could do their, their children's choir practice today, right? So for those of you uh, parents who have kids who participate in the children's choir, if you could just keep that in mind. Other announcements today? How about prayer requests? Good morning. I want to say thank you. I want to say an answer to prayer, if that's okay. I want to thank you very, very much for um, your participation in the work that God is doing in France. So I'm Sonia Becker, and I came back um, with Kent to bring some basketball players to do a, a Warwick uh, workout uh, time this next week, and we got a some pictures this morning from our church in France, and they are so delighted to be together in worshiping God. And they are taking on all the ministries themselves, doing Bible studies and carrying on with the kids' clubs in our absence. And this is a beautiful thing because we've been praying for this and you've been praying for this. And so God's given us this opportunity to come away and allow them to exercise their spiritual muscles. So I just want to say thank you because it's really a result of your prayers and your giving and your being involved in what God's doing around the world. Thank you. Thank you, Sonia. And uh, for those of you who uh, probably aren't aware, uh, Kent and Sonia had some travel difficulties on along the way, uh, you know, with all the different uh, COVID restrictions, depending on which country you're in, uh, it might dictate how well your travel goes. And uh, they ran into some issues, particularly in Canada. Canada's kind of a mess right now. Um, but we're very glad that Kent and his students have made it, and uh, Sonia's here. And uh, we also have Sophia here, who has spent, uh, was, it a, was it a whole year? Five. Five months in Jerusalem, right? Studying at the university there. And um, during our, our brunch time, we're going to set up a microphone for her so she can kind of tell us about her experience. Uh, and uh, you can ask her any questions that you might have of her. Uh, so it should be something interesting to hear about. She's going to give you all that information in Hebrew. Uh, <laughs> so we won't understand a word she's saying. So. <laughs> I'm just kidding about that last part. But Other prayer requests today? I haven't had an update on, on baby chaos. In fact, the last Sunday, you know, um, I know that Hannah had, had t uh, taken that role as a foster parents for chaos. I wasn't fully aware of all the medical problems that chaos was facing. Um, until I got a, a more full uh, update on some of the things that uh, he'll be looking ahead to, going through in the coming weeks and months. Um, it, is that chaos back there? Oh, okay. So that's kind of an answer to prayer already. <laughs> He's not causing chaos? He's just... Uh, okay. <laughs> I thought that was Kenny that was the one doing that. <laughs> well, we're glad you're with us in church today, and things are going well? Ish? as far as they can be? Okay. <laughs> All right. We'll, we'll thank God for, for that today. Anything else? Tina has had um, bladder cancer, and she just started chemo, and we're just hoping that um, her bleeding doesn't come back, because then she has to stop chemo, and she's going to be doing that for a few months. Okay. 
And what was her name? Uh, Tina Friedman. Tina, okay. Yep. Okay. We can certainly pray for her. That happens. Yeah. And I think uh, kind of along those lines, uh, there's probably all kinds of prayer requests like that among us today. And what Rhonda uh, sang about, I think, is, is something that speaks to everybody. You know, we have those moments where we just have to cry out and say, God, I need you now. And uh, for, you know, the, all the people here that might look differently, depending on what you're going through in this life. So with that being said... Uh, our Lord is present with us and hears our prayer requests, so let's bow together and seek his grace. Let's pray. Gracious Lord, what a privilege it is to be able to come to this place of worship, this warm place where we have our scriptures before us, we have fellowship around us, we have songs in our hearts, and we have worship on our minds. We seek to be in the presence of God today because we know that when we're in your presence, you draw our attention upwards, our eyes to the Lord Jesus Christ, our love towards the Lord Jesus Christ. And when we do that, we can't help but keep you at the center of our focus. Father, we thank you for your love for us, your sacrifice for us, your patience with us. Lord, we know that we are sinners. And especially when we come into the presence of God, that sin becomes evident to us. And so first and foremost, we want to ask for your forgiveness for those things that we have done and those things that we have left undone. Lord, you are a God who forgives those who are repentant. And we ask that you would restore us to your favor, that you would bless us with the power of your Holy Spirit and empower us for service in your kingdom. Father, we know that you are a God who answers prayer. And we're just so grateful that Sonia is with us today. Sophia is with us today. Kent and his students have made it to America and are looking ahead to the days of instruction and in fun. And so we're just, uh, just so wonderfully grateful for the fact that you guide and watch over them. We thank you for the ministry that you have entrusted to them in France for all these years and for the spiritual leadership that they have imparted to those who have been under their instruction. And now that they're away, that those same people are taking the, the role of leadership, and that's truly an answer to prayer. So we ask, Lord, that you would continue to bless them, that you would continue to open doors of opportunity so that they might reach people for the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and bring him glory that belongs only to him. Father, we thank you for the work that you're doing in, in baby chaos's life. We thank you for the calling that you have placed on Hannah as well. It's a, a difficult calling. It's not easy, but it's a rewarding one. And so we just ask that you would bless his little body, that you would anoint his little body, that you would prepare the doctors who will be operating on him in the coming days and weeks, and that uh, the recovery would be complete and full so that all involved truly know that healing comes from the Lord alone. You are the God who made each and every hair in our heads, Lord. You know us more than we know ourselves. And so we think about those people like Tina who are suffering from cancer, and like uh, Rhonda's friend who is suffering from a knee injury. Father, you are the creator of the human body. You know the things that need to be done and where our knowledge comes to an end, that is when you begin. And so we offer these people to you. We ask that you would be glorified in their healing, that you'd be glorified not only in their physical healing, but their spiritual healing as well, Lord. We know that physical healing doesn't do any good if we are spiritually sick. So wrap, wrap them around your Holy Spirit. Fill them with your Holy Spirit so that their cup is overflowing. Help them to know that you are God alone and that all good things come from your loving hand. And for all unspoken prayer requests today, Father, as Rhonda so beautifully sang for us, for some of us, our hearts cry out, God, I need you now. Help us to give our burdens to you and to trust you wholly and completely. We thank you once again for your love for us. May your will be done in our lives. 
And in general, we can say, as you teach us in the Lord's Prayer, that your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Be glorified in all we do individually and in the life of this church. And we ask these things through Christ our Lord. Amen. One of the challenges in studying the book of Daniel is that it not only provides us an account of biblical history, but it also has elements that fall into the category of the prophetic. That is, through Daniel, God gives us glimpses into future events. Of course, what was future to Daniel is now history to us, at least in some respects. And it's for this reason that some of the scholars and uh, biblical interpreters over the centuries have had great difficulty with the book of Daniel. In fact, many scholars have taken the position that the book wasn't written by Daniel at all, but is rather a document that was written by another writer claiming to be Daniel centuries later. The fundamental reason that these scholars take a position like this is because of the prophetic elements that are found within the book of Daniel. We might paraphrase their argument as such. Daniel couldn't possibly have written, uh, been written by these, this Old Testament character because his depiction of the future is simply too accurate. Therefore, it must have been written by another author who was looking back at historical events as though they didn't happen yet. Well, if you didn't catch the brunt of that argument, uh, it's it's essentially this. Daniel couldn't possibly be the author of the book because his prophecies are just too accurate. (laughs) But we expect inaccurate prophecies if the God of heaven and earth were the one revealing these things to Daniel. I've always found that argument to be a rather silly one if a person is trying to take the book of Daniel seriously as the inspired word of God. For me, there is no question that Daniel is the author of the book, and one of the primary evidence for its genuineness is the precision accuracy in which he portrays future events. However, I also need to tell you, if you're not already aware of this, that the book of Daniel is a kind of springboard that launches those who study the book into varying positions that have have to do with end times theology. It might seem hard to imagine that an Old Testament book could have such an influence on matters that deal with the end of the age, but in fact, it is the prophetic aspects found within the book of Daniel that really fill in the blanks as it concerns some of the events that have not yet happened, events in God's prophetic plan for the future. Thus far in our study of the book, we've only seen events that we can describe as historical This morning, we're going to wade our way very gently and carefully into the first of the prophetic aspects found in the book of Daniel, and we will see just why some scholars have such difficulty accepting it as a genuine work of prophecy. In addition to that, we will also see why the book plays such a major role in our end times theology as we delve into some of the more controversial elements of what God has revealed through this prophet. We will see how we are uh, really already pretty well equipped with some of the knowledge that we already have about uh, what God plans for the future, and we'll see how this particular text fits pretty well with what we already know about God's plan for the future. Last week, we were introduced to a a private matter that happened in the mind of King Nebuchadnezzar while he was lying asleep on his bed. The king had a bad dream, a disturbing dream, or dreams, depending on how we want to try and interpret that, 
But it's a dream that would not allow the king a good night's sleep from that point onward. He was shaken by it. We heard about the challenge to the wise men of Babylon in that not only were they to interpret the king's dream for him, but they were first to tell him what the dream was. Quite the challenge. And if they could do that, they were thereby demonstrating their ability to know what is unknown. And when they couldn't do it, because no human being could, the order was issued that all the wise men of Babylon were to be executed, put to death. Daniel, of course, became aware of the king's declaration, and after he and his companions spent the night in prayer, the Lord revealed to Daniel this secret that took place in the king's mind. This morning, we were picking up where we left off last week, and Daniel is now going to approach the king with the knowledge that God has given to him. And as we make our way through this portion of chapter 2, we will see truths about God that we can hold on to firmly and to apply to our own lives of faith if we are only willing to do so. There are timely reminders for us that the God we serve does not change. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. The first thing that we can learn from this portion of scripture is that the power of God is demonstrated when man's abilities are exhausted. Have you known that to be true in your life? Sometimes it's only when we have come to the last of our energy that we then turn to God. One of the lessons that we often have to learn the hard way is that God should never be our last resort. As a person of faith, God should always be number one, first on our list. I find that most uh, visible when people are going through life-threatening illnesses, which many of you have, some of your family members and loved ones have. And of course, we should always seek medical, medical attention for uh, whatever illnesses and diseases we might be facing because God can and does use the medical professions. Of course, he does. But ultimately, our trust is not in medicine. Our trust is in the true physician. And it's often when the doctors have no more answers, when they come into you in your, in your little office visiting uh, room there, and they say, well, we, there's nothing more that we can do. There's no more treatments that we can offer. It's often in those moments of extreme anxiety that the power of God is then revealed. That's where it begins. And it's an awesome thing. Daniel has already demonstrated for us what genuine faith in God looks like. God has answered his prayer. Verse 24 tells us, Then Daniel went to Arioch, whom the king had appointed to execute the wise men of Babylon. He was the executioner. And he said to him, Do not execute the wise men of Babylon. Take me to the king, and I will interpret the dream for the king. Daniel is going to do what even the best of the best of the best in the kingdom of Babylon could not do. Take me to the king, and I will do this thing for him. Quite literally, the very lives of the wise men of Babylon are resting in Daniel's claim to be able to do what he has now claimed that he could do. And of course, when it comes to revealing the king's secret, it will be very quickly evident if Daniel actually can do this or he can't do that. Nebuchadnezzar will be listening very, very carefully, no doubt, to what Daniel has to say. And if there is anything that seems just a little bit off, Nebuchadnezzar is going to know about it. He's going to know that Daniel, he can't do it. Daniel and the rest of the wise men will then be put to death, probably rather violently. So Arioch took Daniel to the king and at once, and he said, I have found a man among the exiles of Judah who can tell the king what his dream means. Did he? Did he really find him? Arioch was the man who was appointed by the king to carry out the deaths, the executions, which explains why he seems to be taking credit for finding Daniel. To say that he had given a little bit too, too much information to Daniel, he was having a, a chatty conversation with him when he was supposed to be putting to de him to death would mean that he was not following the king's orders, was he? And so to hide that failure, he, he sort of takes credit for uh, finding Daniel and bringing Daniel before the king. The king had given Daniel a little bit of time, as we know from last week, to uh, seek out these matters, to interpret the king's dream, and now it's the moment of truth. The king asked Daniel, also called Belteshazzar, that's his Babylonian name, are you able to tell me what I saw in my dream and interpret it? Both of those things. Again, Nebuchadnezzar would know, certainly, if Daniel was bluffing. The moment he starts revealing any details about the dream, he can't fake that. 
And it's interesting that Daniel begins by reminding the king that none of the so-called other wise men, the best of the best in Babylon, could reveal the matter to the king. They couldn't do it. Couldn't even try to do it. Daniel replied, no wise man, enchanter, magician, or diviner can explain to the king the mystery he is asked about. However, as Daniel makes clear, there is a God in heaven. The God whom Daniel serves. He alone can know things that are unknown. He says, there is a God in heaven who reveals mysteries. He has shown the king Nebuchadnezzar what will happen in the days to come. Your dream and the visions that pass through your mind as you were lying in your bed are these. In other words, this God has made known to Daniel the mystery of the king's dream. A dream, we might add, that foretells what will happen in the future. This is a prophecy about future events. Only God can know future events before they happen, and we can see that Daniel in no way, shape, or form is taking credit for what God alone can do. Despite standing before the most powerful man in the known world, a violent man, despite his life literally hanging in the balance, Daniel is giving all the glory to God. It's not me. It's God who's doing this. With all the education of Babylon, with all the wisdom and experience of the wise man, only Daniel's God could reveal what the king demanded. The power of God is demonstrated when man's abilities are exhausted. But now the moment of truth has come. What is the dream that the king has dreamed? And that brings us to our second truth for this morning, and that the knowledge of God is absolute. When God reveals a prophecy concerning the future, it's as though it has already happened. It is so certain as that, we can, that we can consider it as though it's already happened. There is no question about it. There is no changing the future in matters like this. When it comes to God's prophetic revelation, the outcome is absolute. Daniel begins, as your majesty was lying there, your mind turned to the things to come. And the revealer of mysteries showed you what is going to happen. The statement alone tells us that without a shadow of a doubt that God had given the king, King Nebuchadnezzar, a glimpse into the future. We would all want to see that every once in a while, wouldn't we? Would you want to know the future? But again, Daniel makes sure that there is no question as to where this dream and the following interpretation is coming from. As for me, this mystery has been revealed to me, not because I have a greater wisdom than anyone else alive, but so that your majesty may know the interpretation and that you may understand what went through your mind. The king didn't even know, didn't know how to understand it. Nebuchadnezzar saw the future. God revealed to him the future. Interesting. But the thing that we really want to know is, what did this glimpse into the future look like? And Daniel tells us exactly what the king saw. Your majesty looked... And there before you stood a large statue, an enormous, dazzling statue, awesome in appearance. The head of the statue was made of pure gold, its chest of arms and silver, its belly and thighs of bronze, its uh, legs of iron, its feet partly of iron and partly of baked clay, hardened clay. While you were watching, a rock was cut, but not by human hands. It struck the statue on its feet of iron and clay and smashed them. And the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, and the gold were all broken into pieces and became like chaff in the summer of the floor of the, thre- the threshing floor. The wind swept them away without leaving a trace, but the rock that struck the statue became a huge mountain and filled the whole earth. What? <laughs> the future looked like a giant statue? A statue that eventually gets broken to pieces by a growing rock. Ha! Huh. I think we can see why king, the king was so confused about the dream himself. What in the world is that about? The image was certainly enough to terrify the king. That's what we're supposed to read here in the subtext here is a terrifying image. And the fact that such a mighty structure was destroyed by a tiny rock, that didn't make much sense, let alone about the, the little rock that eventually grows into the uh, mountain and covers the whole earth. I've had some pretty weird dreams before, but I think this falls into the same category of being weird. I have to imagine, though, that Nebuchadnezzar was sitting on the edge of his chair as Daniel spoke. Everything that Daniel has said is spot on. The king knew absolutely that Daniel was revealing what the king saw, and I believe that he was hanging on every word that he said. Wow. 
Whether Nebuchadnezzar remembered all the aspects of his dreams is kind of a matter of debate. But as Daniel spoke to the king, the terror of the statue, the violence of its crumbling to the ground came rushing back. He said, yeah, that was it. God, through Daniel, has put his finger on the very thing that was troubling the king. And I think the message that we can take from this is that God knows the things. He can put his finger on the things that are troubling us as well. If the secrets found within the mind of the king are like an open book to our God, then we can take comfort in the fact that God knows the secret things in our, of our minds as well. Now, perhaps that is more of a disturbing thought for you than a comforting thought that God knows your secrets. Where can we hide from a God who is omnipresent? Nowhere. What can we keep secret from a God who is omniscient? Nothing. What limits can we place on a God who is omnipotent? None. We can echo Hannah's prayer in 1 Samuel chapter 2 when she says, There is no, no one holy like the Lord. There is no one else beside you. There is no rock like our God. When God reveals to us his mysteries, it demonstrates to us the power of our God and our response should always, always, always be praise. The knowledge of God is absolute. But if you recall, knowing the dream was only half the matter. Daniel has now successfully demonstrated that he knew the king's dream with all of its strange and odd imagery. But perhaps the most important aspect of the king's request is to now interpret that dream. What does it mean? How does this show what the future holds? And we now come to the heart of the issue and to the most theologically important part of Daniel chapter 2. We will briefly discuss some of the more uh, difficult aspects of this prophetic vision. But despite how we might interpret it, one thing is certain. The complete rule of God over, the, over all he has made is certain. I need to tell you that the main difficulty with this passage is not with the first part of Daniel's interpretation, but in fact the second. We'll see uh, in just a minute uh, why that is. But in general, what Daniel is describing is a succession of future world empires. Empires that begins first and foremost with the Babylonian Empire. Daniel says in verses 36 through 38, This was the dream, and now we shall interpret it to the king. Your majesty, you are the king of kings. The God of heaven has given you dominion and power and might and glory in your hands. He has placed all mankind and the beasts of the field and the birds in the sky. Wherever they might live, he has made you ruler over them all. You are the head of gold. Now some people might hear those words and immediately become uncomfortable with the way that Daniel describes King Nebuchadnezzar. From a purely New Testament perspective, Jesus is the only King of Kings and Lord of Lords. We know that. And further, what does it mean that God has given the kingdom uh, to, to, to Nebuchadnezzar, He's given him dominion and power and might and glory and ruler even over the natural things of this world? What does that mean? Isn't this giving too much glory to King Nebuchadnezzar, a man? And the answer is yes, it is. If we understand Daniel's words to be taken in a purely literal sense, Yes. According to Daniel, however, God is God alone. We already know that. He's already made that clear. So to, to understand Daniel to be speaking about Nebuchadnezzar as being on par with his God is simply unreasonable. If you've ever watched a movie where the, the setting of the movie takes place in medieval times and in the realm of, say, a certain king, something like that, what you will notice is that everything in that kingdom under the realm of the king falls under the ownership of that king which also includes wild animals. In that case, uh, if a hunter shoots a game bird on the king's land, that hunter is breaking the law because that game bird belonged to the king, even though it was a wild animal. I think that is the way to understand the way Daniel is describing Nebuchadnezzar here. Essentially, what Daniel is saying is that in King Nebuchadnezzar, the pinnacle of human rulership is on full display. It can't get any higher. He is the head of gold situated at the very top of this statue, and in, in his kingdom, the Babylonian kingdom, all that is possible in human rulership is demonstrated. But after identifying Nebuchadnezzar's place within this statue, Daniel uh, very quickly moves on to the next few parts of the statue. The golden head represents the Babylonian kingdom, 
And if the whole image represents the future, then we can say is that what follows are descriptions of kingdoms that will come after the Babylonian kingdom. And it's precisely what Daniel describes. After you, he says, another kingdom will arise inferior to yours. Next, a third kingdom, one of bronze, will rule over the whole earth. It's interesting that Daniel really scarcely gives us any details about the second and third kingdoms, uh, which according to history are first the kingdom of the Medes and the Persians, and then the kingdom of the Greeks, led by the famous Alexander the Great. The Medo-Persian kingdom actually begins before we even get to the end of the book of Daniel. Uh, A few centuries later, after the the Medo-Persian empire uh, is in existence, Alexander the Great comes along and he conquers those, uh, those two kingdoms that are merged into one with very decisive and great victories. And if you're a student of history, you'll know something about Alexander the Great. He is uh, known to have said, uh, to weep, uh, weep actually, when all of his kingdoms were conquered and there was nothing left for him to do as a military conqueror. And so he cries because there was no more worlds for him to conquer. That fits pretty well with what Daniel has said about the third kingdom and that it will rule over the whole earth. You can also see why some scholars doubt the authenticity of the book of Daniel because how could, how could he possibly know what kingdoms would dominate the, uh, the world unless he was writing after they had already existed? And he's looking back now. But again, as a prophet of God, his interpretation of the future is absolute and perfect because God, God is the one who has given it to him. Thus far, there's not much in the way of Controversy and what Daniel has said to the king, but now we come to the fourth and the fifth kingdoms, which represent essentially the lower half of the statue as well as the rock that finally destroys the statue. Finally, Daniel says there will be a fourth kingdom, strong as iron, for iron breaks and smashes everything. And as iron breaks things to pieces, so it will crush and break all others that came before it. What is this fourth kingdom? Well, for those... Once again, of those of you who know your history, it was the Roman Empire who came after the Greeks and controlled the world with an iron fist. They were brutal. The Roman Empire controlled more territory than any other kingdom, which was essentially broken into two divisions of east and west. That also kind of fits with the imagery of the legs uh, as part of the statue, Two, two separate legs, but they're part of the same thing. And of course, as Christians, we know a fair amount about the Roman Empire because it was the Roman Empire that was in power during the time of our Lord Jesus Christ. It was the Roman governor, Pontius Pilate, who interacted with Jesus and eventually had him put to death, crucified. But again, thus far, Daniel's prophetic view is really fairly straightforward. It's just following history, right? The problem for biblical interpreters comes with Daniel's further description about the fourth kingdom and its relation to the fifth and final kingdom. Just as you saw, the feet and the toes were partly of baked clay and partly of iron, so this will be a divided kingdom. Yet it will have some of the strength of iron in it, even as you saw iron mixed with clay. As the toes were partly of iron and partly of clay, so this kingdom will be partly strong and partly brittle. And just as you saw the iron mixed with baked clay, so the people will be a mixture and will not remain united any more than iron mixes with clay. In the time of those kings, he says, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed, nor will it be left to another people. That is, nothing's coming after it. It will crush all those kingdoms and bring them to an end, but it will itself endure forever. Here's the issue. We know that the Medo-Persian kingdoms came after the Babylonian kingdom. We know that the Greek kingdom came after the Medo-Persian kingdom. We know that the Roman kingdom came after the Greek kingdom. But when did this fifth kingdom, God's kingdom, crush all the other kingdoms that came before it so that no other kingdom follows it? Where do we find that in history? Some scholars argue that when Jesus established the church at Pentecost, God's kingdom was established then. And in just a few centuries, the Roman Empire was no more. It was gone. Although that might be a a tempting interpretation to to take, the fact of history is that the church actually had very little to do with the collapse of the Roman Empire. In fact, uh, even today, historians debate about what was the cause of the Roman Empire's decline, and nobody really knows. For sure. Further, Daniel says, in the time of those kings, 
which seems to suggest that the feet of the statue have further uh, symbolic significance, particularly as it concerns the clay and the iron that comprise the feet and the toes of this image. The symbolism seems to suggest that the Roman Empire is divided into uh, ten kingdoms, which is symbolized by the ten toes. If we take this in conjunction with yet another prophetic, uh, prophetic element found later on in Daniel, in chapter 7, then this interpretation of the ten divided kings fits actually pretty well. In chapter 7, Daniel says this regarding a terrible beast of the last days. After this, I saw in the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible and strong exceedingly. And it had great iron teeth, same element as the fourth kingdom that we've just talked about. It devoured and break in pieces and stamped the, resi the, the residue with the feet of it, and it was diverse from all the beasts that were before it, and it had ten horns. Horn is a symbol of uh, kingship and power. And further, if we want a description about this from the book of Revelation itself, we need to look no further than Revelation 17. So he carried me away into the spirit, into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet-colored beast full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. Daniel has told us that the fifth and final kingdom is God's kingdom. So here then is our dilemma. Where do we place the Roman Empire with the ten toes in the chronology of God's prophetic vision for the future? That vision with the rock, that tiny rock hits the statue, hits the image, and the whole thing comes crumbling down and establishes God's reign forever. When do we find that in history? For many theologians, the only recourse is to say that this terrifying statue that Nebuchadnezzar has seen not only covers the few uh, centuries immediately following the reign of the Babylonian king Nebuchadnezzar, but extends far into the future to when God himself will establish the kingdom of God on earth in the reign of the Lord Jesus Christ. Daniel tells us this is the meaning of the vision of the rock cut out of the mountain, not by human hands. He keeps saying that, doesn't he? A rock that broke the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold to pieces. It's a future kingdom. The kingdom of God. And it will be the kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ that will smash into pieces all earthly kingdoms that have, have become before it and it will blow them away. The wind will blow them away like chaff on a summer threshing floor, Daniel tells us. And that kingdom, which started out small, started out insignificant, will grow into a mighty mountain, fill the whole earth. God's kingdom, the last kingdom, will have no end. Sounds wonderful, doesn't it? As people of faith, we look ahead to that day when every knee will bow, every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. But again, if we look at history, that hasn't happened yet. There are still kingdoms alive and well right now, today, thriving in our world. Kingdoms that do not confess our Lord Jesus Christ as Savior. We can ask our missionaries if that's true, and they'll say, yeah, absolutely. So how does that fit with the prophetic interpretation that Daniel has given us here? This is a point of contention that theologians still argue about today. In fact, I had a, a short debate about this a couple of weeks ago with one of our fellow pastors. But the most reasonable argument seems to be that the Roman Empire that uh, came after the kingdom of Alexander the Great, the, the kingdom that ruled the world with an iron fist, well, it fell apart. And it fell apart under its own moral depravity. It fell apart from the inside out. And it simply faded into existence, uh, non-existence, I should say. But at some point in the future, that empire will somehow show up again. It will reemerge with the same attribute of iron that it once had, but now with an added element of clay. The new kingdom will be a divided kingdom, a fragile kingdom, just as iron does not mix with clay. And it will be at that time when the last kingdom, the kingdom of God, will break into human history completely and totally destroying all the worldly kingdoms that came before it and establishing the reign of our Lord Jesus Christ forever and ever. No matter when it happens in the future, it is certain nonetheless. God's kingdom will destroy all, the other, all other kingdoms and the reign of our Lord Jesus Christ will last for eternity. The complete rule of God is certain over all that he has made. Whew. Are you with me? 
Uh, as I was looking forward to this part of Daniel uh, chapter 2 this week, I was also dreading it because of its interpretive challenges. And I knew that I was going to have to go a little long. Sorry, Lily. Despite some of the more difficult parts of Daniel's prophetic revelation, I hope that you were able to see the big picture here and that our God is sovereign over all that he has made. There is nothing that is hidden from him and no power in the world, no matter how massive, no matter how, how shiny and new it might be, no matter how strong it might be able to, uh, to appear to us, it's not able to stand before our kingdom, the kingdom of God. As believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, we are part of God's kingdom. No kingdom of this world. We're a part of God's kingdom. And as Daniel tells us about the future and the time of those kings, the God of heaven will set up his kingdom that will never be destroyed. It will crush all those kingdoms, bring them to an end, but it itself will endure forever. Even if we find ourselves unclear about some aspects of prophecy, and interpretation, uh, interpreting some of those things, we know absolutely and certainly, completely, that God's kingdom is eternal and that Jesus Christ is Lord. No matter what earthly king is sitting on the throne, no matter what worldly kingdom is in power or what is going on in the world around us, the truth that we can live by, live our lives by, is that Jesus Christ is Lord. Daniel trusted in his God and he has once again given us an example to follow in our lives of faith as well. Do you trust God for today? Do you trust God for tomorrow? Do you trust God for the days and weeks after that? Do you trust God even if you don't know the future? Because our trust is in the God who does know the future. And that future is certain. We know who wins. We know how it ends. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this wonderful book, this book that demonstrates to us what faith in you is all about. And even in the difficulties of the interpretation parts, we know that even if we're confused, even if there's disagreement, ultimately we can rest on the truth that you are in control. In you there is no end. You have already written the end of the story, and we are part of that kingdom, Lord. We are part of your future. And for that, we thank you and we praise you. Help us, Lord, to follow after Daniel's example and lead lives of faith that trust you completely and absolutely. We ask these things in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior.